Greetings, can you hear me? I'm hoping so. I'm delighted to welcome you to this event, which is a conversation and a celebration of Dipesh Chakrabarti's much anticipated book, The Climate of History and a Planetary Age. My name is Emily Lynn Osborne, and I am the interim dean of the Graham School of Continuing Professional and Liberal Studies. I am also a professor in the Department of History here at the University of Chicago. And I am delighted to be here to moderate this discussion with my colleagues who were some of my favorite people as it happens. That is with Depeche Chakrabarti, as well as Frederick Albertan Johnson and Elizabeth Chatterjee. Before I formally introduce our presenters, I will offer up a few rules of the road for how this webinar will operate. And I will also offer up some thanks to the people and institutions who helped to bring it about. This is a webinar. That means that you are not able to use your microphone and your camera is turned off. We are recording this event so that we may post it for online for people to watch at a later date. You are able to communicate with the moderators and ask questions of our speakers through the question and answer box. We encourage you to do so. Depeche and the panelists are eager to engage the wider audience in discussion and we are reserving the last part of our time together to do just that. We will likely not be able to address all of your questions, but we will try. One of the wonders of Zoom is how it enables people to come together from across the planet. So please feel free to let us know your location when you comment or ask a question. You'll find the button to open the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom window. We are also providing live captioning of this event. If you would like to be able to read the proceedings as they unfold, please click on the CC button on the bottom of your screen. Some thanks are in order. Behind this webinar are a number of organizations, the Chicago Center for Contemporary Theory, 3CT, the Neubauer Collegium for Culture and Society, 
the Graham School of Continuing Liberal and Professional Studies, the University of Chicago Press, who are publishers of Depeche's book, and the Seminary Co-op Bookstore. We encourage you, as ever, to purchase your copy of Depeche's book from a local bookseller. And if that's not possible, consider ordering it from the Seminary Co-op Bookstore. Of course, behind these organizations and this webinar are actual people. And so I extend thanks to Jessica Musselwhite and Meredith Nini. Julia Mead, a graduate student in history, is helping to manage the chat box and define terms and provide useful links. Kristen, Kristen Liska is providing the live captioning. And now to our author. Depeche Chakabarty is the Lawrence A. Kimpton Distinguished Service Professor of History. He is also a member of the Department of South Asian Languages and Civilizations. He has published widely and copiously, and indeed this current book is a culmination of a long and deep intellectual trajectory that encompasses, among many other things, subaltern studies, post-colonial theory, and modern South Asian history. Our moderators are Elizabeth Chatterjee, Assistant Professor of Environmental History and the College, she is a recent and wonderful addition to our department, but she is not unfamiliar to us here at the University of Chicago, for she spent two years here on a postdoctoral fellowship in our Anthropocene group. She works on energy, infrastructure, and environmental history in India. Frederick Alberton Johnson is Associate Professor of British History, Conceptual and History Studies of Science, and the College. He is a historian of the British Empire, the Enlightenment, and science and the environment. He has published on the Scottish origins of environmentalism and on a late Victorian utopian movement dedicated to simple living. I will make one further note. The comments that both Liz and Frederick drafted in anticipation of this event have taken quite notably the form of a letter. Dear Depeche, they each start, that each was inspired to produce an epistolary missive reflects, I think, the way that this book provokes deep contemplation and thought. It is also a testament, I think, to the warmth and generosity with which Depeche shares his ideas and to the way that he inspires those qualities in others. So at this point, I will turn the platform over to Depeche, who will make a few opening remarks. Then Liz will comment and Frederick will comment. There will then be a conversation among them and then we will open up to the audience. Again, welcome and thank you. Depeche. Thank you, Emily, for that very kind and warm introduction. Um, I repeat your words, if I may, in thanking the individuals uh, behind the scene who helped us prepare this for this webinar and who are actually administering this webinar. Uh, people at the press, uh, people in 3CT, people at the Collegium at the Seminary Co-op. I thank them all uh, for organizing this event. Um, I have to mention from the press, my good friend and editor, Alan Thomas, who has worked with me for decades uh, in connection with several of my books. Uh, honestly, without his guidance and patience, uh, the journey would have been much more difficult. I also have to thank the friends who have collected here uh, uh, today from, I know, from different parts of uh, the world uh, and, and many probably from India where they're going through a very, very tough time where the pandemic has actually become an epidemic almost running through every household claiming victims. So I really thank them for, for being here. Thanks also to the climate change group at the Newbar Collegium that has sustained this work. And uh, the group includes three people here present here, uh, Frederick Johnson, Emily Osborne, uh, and Liz Chatterjee. Uh, and I should also mention Benjamin Morgan and our friend Julia Adney Thomas, who uh, were also and have been parts of that, that group. Um, I also have to thank our uh, in-house journal, Critical Inquiry, which is produced by the university, which is one of the best journals in the humanities. And my colleagues and, and friends there have sustained this project from the very inception. From the, yeah. So it's a great honor to be in conversation with uh, the three of you, Emily, Frederick, and Liz, and to be speaking to you 
uh, the audience here. Um, just a few words I wanted to say about uh, just introdu introducing the book. Um, and I, 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 I want to time myself so that I don't go over, well, I'm giving myself eight minutes, but hopefully uh, it will be under eight minutes. Um, so uh, the book is really, uh, for me, what was a journey of discovery. I mean, I uh, grew up to be a historian of uh, anti-colonial movement, of democracy, of the history of rights, of freedom, um, and eventually of globalization. So when I wrote Provincializing Europe, I was very much uh, speaking of the intellectual consequences of uh, becoming global. global. And uh, the, the provincialism came, the book came out of my own feeling of becoming global. Um, and 20 years ago, most of our conversations would have been about globalization and how it was changing our everyday world. People had moved, technology was bringing us, to, us together. And even in everyday life, I, I remember my uh, very dear friend now departed, uh, Don Willard in Hyde Park in Chicago, who would uh, often talk to uh, me and, 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 and Rochuna about um, how they'd been to an intercultural wedding, a, a, a marriage event between an Indian person and an American person, and how fascinated they were with, with the Indian rituals. Uh, we would talk about watching uh, Monsoon Wedding, the film, as part of uh, this globalizing consciousness. We would talk about uh, California and its huge Asian American population. So that, so we would, we as ordinary people in everyday life and, and my historian colleagues were kind of in agreement that we were in the age of globalization. And uh, 20 years ago, that, that's what one would, have, one would have thought. Today, all that is still there. But in addition, if you look at our everyday conversation, uh, we talk about not just globalization, but we talk about things that actually um, uh, specialists in geology or in climate science uh, or in oceanography uh, study, uh, but but those but some of their words and expressions have become part of our everyday conversation today, and and all these words and expressions relate back not to just what was global, like the technology that brought the world together, but actually about what you might regard as planetary processes. What what happens uh, as as this planet keeps uh, supporting various forms of life on it. So we today talk about global warming. We talk about excess carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. We talk about the warming of the seas, the rise of sea levels, extreme weather events, the dangers of wildfires and cyclones, infectious diseases, zoonotic, zoonotic diseases, diseases that come to us from wildlife, the pandemic being one example of it. And we also question if, if some or a lot of this is not because of what we humans are doing. So while previously we used to talk about or every day talk about things that were global and human things that humans had created, now we seem to be talking about um, how humans are impacting on processes that are much older than even human existence sometimes, processes that uh, have been going on for, for sometimes for millions of years and how we are impacting through our technology, our numbers, our pursuit of well-being on, on, on those processes. So the book argues that we are not just in the age of globalization anymore. We are also at the dawn of a new age that I have called in the group, the planetary age in the book, planetary age. Uh, that is when our event, we are becoming slowly aware of planetary processes. This doesn't happen in an even way. We don't all move at the same pace, but the talk about renewable and non-renewable is for fuel. That's part of everyday life. And if you think about it, we even that opposition, the, the distinction we make between renewable and non-renewable fuels is actually about distinction between geological time and human time, because even what we regard as non-renewable fossil fuels could be perfectly renewable if we could hang around for, let's say, 200 million years or 300 million years, the planet might make them again. So, so our gradually an awareness of how the planet works is 
seeping into our consciousness out of the many different kind of crises that we face. And the book is really about <clears throat> my journey uh, from understanding global events as global to, to a point where I began to see the planetary aspect of them. And, 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 and the argument at one level is how, um, how the, in, the increasing pace of globalization, you might say, the increasing pace of technology, the destruction of forests, the environmental crisis, was making us, bring us face to face that something we call the planet. And the planet is a much more ancient formation than human civilization. And the usual example I give of that in the classroom and I, in, in the book too, is the air we breathe. This air we breathe <coughs> has maintained oxygen um, at a certain level that has ensured that, uh, that the level never went up so high that everything went up in flames nor did it ever go down so low that all uh, animals uh, choke to death, uh, animals that breathe, in, including ourselves. So that air is critical to our existence, without which we can't live. I mean, the very, the very fact that we are animals with lungs has something to do with our bodies that have kind of evolved uh, with that dependency on, on, on the atmosphere. And if you, are, if you ask a geologist for how long the, the atmosphere has been doing this, the number is staggering. It's for, they say for about 375 million years, the atmosphere has maintained uh, the share of oxygen at, at this kind of level. So clearly this atmosphere, which is, which is made by the planet, and you know, because oxygen is a reactive gas, the planet has to constantly supply the air with fresh oxygen. And again, if you go back to the scientists and ask who supplies the, uh, this oxygen, you will find that forms of life we normally regard as inferior forms of life, planktons, uh, microbial forms of life, fungi, uh, plants, they supply this oxygen on which we critically breathe. So you realize that this air, which a variety of forms of life uh, actually support to keep in, in, in place and which in turn supports a variety of form, form of life, including ours, uh, was not necessarily made by the planet with us in view. So in the book, I argue that the globe was something that we humans made, starting with European imperialism, starting with capitalism, uh, with our technology, we made it. But the planet is something else. We, we depend on it for our life every day, and we can discuss this more, but it, it, is, it, doesn't, almost, it doesn't, as it were, look back to us. It, it does all these things, but so we interfere with the planet at our own peril, uh, and it, it produces things like the, the pandemic we are looking at. Um, uh, we can talk more about that too. So I'm, I'm at the end of the time I gave myself. My timer is saying, don't go on anymore. Uh, I won't, without uh, uh, adding uh, anything to what I have to say, we, we can come back to some of these points later. I will be um, yielding my place to my two esteemed colleagues, Frederick Johnson and Liz Chatterjee. Thank you. Thank you, Depesh. Liz? Depesh, thank you so much. It's a real honor and a total joy to be here celebrating the launch of this book with you, which you've been working on in some form for the entire time I've known you, but boy, is it worth the wait. Um, in my comments today, I hope to share with our friends here today some of the sense of exhilaration that I felt upon reading these essays for the first time, a bit like looking out over a huge precipice, feeling something truly mind altering. Characteristically though, this book is dazzling in scope, but modest in form. This isn't some sort of bombastic 900 page hardback that clobbers you around the head and promises easy answers. But as you suggest, its method is a journey. We travel along your path with you intellectually in a very refreshing way. And you welcome us in to your realizations, to the transformations, in your ideas. 
So, for example, we see a shift from the, the very first uh, major chapter, 2009's famous four theses and its species history. I mean, in itself, in 2009, that was like a bolt out of the blue, the notion of humans as having biological and geological agency as a collective. But you take us actually across the book through your changing thoughts to somewhere I think even more radical. This journey with you is something cumulative, something deeply refreshing that opens up all sorts of new conversations rather than closing them down. So what is that radicalism? I think we got a hint there in your opening remarks. We've been so used to thinking in terms of the global in this human-centered notion of time and space, global exploration, global capitalism, globalization. The notion that we've entered the Anthropocene, the purported epoch in which humans act on the Earth system as a geological force has been taken by plenty of folks in that kind of safe, comfortable direction. They kept that human-centered global frame. So they, they reassure us that we humans are after all special. We are homo deus, the God species. And this second Copernican revolution that our present ecological predicament reveals, they say just reverses the first. It puts us actually back center stage, now as the wise planetary doctors of the global climate. Instead, what your book does is it re really restores the true shock of the age that we live in, very gently persuading us to confront the human predicament. Our ecological crisis, multidimensional as it is, reveals that the planet, Earth, our home, is in fact profoundly other. It's much, much larger than us. It's much, much older. It doesn't need us. In fact, it's just one of a whole host of planets, some of which have undergone global warming all by themselves without any need from us at all. The history of our Earth, then, is not reducible to our histories. As you say, Earth system scientists are themselves historians, but we simply come too late in the story of the Earth to be its protagonist. So I think planet, this term, can kind of sound cold, rocky, overwhelming, but you don't leave us there standing fearfully and grim looking up at the asteroids like something out of the Lars von Trier film. Frederick suggests that you are a pioneer, not of the environmental humanities, but of the Earth system humanities. And I really like that framing. You offer us a series of different directions to think through our human predicament. I just want to pull out a handful of those from the book. First, you're clear that this globe planet distinction isn't some sort of binary. Indeed, it's through the very global Cold War project of mapping and rummaging through for natural resources that we begin to reveal the planetary, to confront it. And in turn, with plans for, say, geoengineering or solar powered versions of preserving the status quo, the global in turn seeps back into the planetary. So this global and planetary, I think, is a really fertile rift. Second, you remind us that the planet is not just this rock floating in space. It is, you say, a dynamic ensemble of relationships, like the state is for Hegel, or capital is for Marx. And Earth system processes are co-actors then in the drama of the planetary age alongside collective human activities. Third, you show us that the planetary has a spatial as well as a temporal character. We inhabit the critical zone, this surface layer of, of the near earth. But through extractivism, through earthquakes, say, we're confronted again with the planet in an alternative form, the deep earth. And finally, you point out that the planetary confronts us with a new set of political demands to think beyond the human, beyond the present, while at the same time, bearing in mind intrahuman justice. 
of course, I'm valorizing your work. And so my first question or in lieu of a question is really a request. Please correct my misreadings here. How do you see these, these different facets of the planetary fitting together? I like the original word that you used, which was that we should cross hatch these different histories, zooming in and zooming out between scales from global capitalism to the history of the human species, its evolutionary history, to life as a whole, and all the way out to say the carbon cycle, the nitrogen cycle. How then might we start to imagine these interlocking scales and start to write these cross-hatched histories? As the book goes on, the role of technology becomes increasingly striking. You make really fabulous use of Carl Schmitt's allegory of the ship. So unlike life on land, life on the ship is totally dependent on technology. Similarly, what Peter Haff has called the technosphere is now the condition of possibility for all human life on Earth, rich and poor. Zoom might be the most visible version for us richies, but you remind us that also fertilizers electric irrigation pumps and so on are necessary to feed the world's growing, growing population. And these technologies are part of the human complex, you say. They may even have a sort of agency. So my second question then is, what role has technology come to play in your thinking about the globe and the planet? Finally, the book is really unusual and refreshing in centering the post-colonial global south, rather than the much more familiar terrain of say, British steam engines, American consumer culture cars and so on, we meet the subaltern modernizers of urban Indi India, who are really proud of their new air conditioning units, which they need because temperatures really are rising. This is driven by need and not greed. So I was, in my final third question, going to pose your, the, the question you raised back to you. In what ways are the globe's anti-colonial modernizers, you mentioned, say, Nehru, NASA, Mao, Senghor, even Fanon, more than Naipaul's mimic, mimic men? In what ways are they more than just belated echoes of Western modernizers still stuck in some sort of inherited developmental regime of historical time that was actually forged elsewhere. So I was going to ask you that. But as a fellow South Asianist with friends and family in the region, I have to ask a much more urgent question. As you said, right now, India is in the midst of an awful heart-wrenching catastrophe. And as COVID-19 tears through the country, how do we start to make sense of this all too man-made tragedy, a moment when the history, history of biological life and the history of globalization seem to be colliding. So I, I ask this in spite of the spirit of celebration in which we're gathered here today, because you, you teach us to look unflinchingly at the hard truths of the human predicament. And there's really no one on earth whose views of that predicament I would like to hear now. So congratulations again. Um, with great admiration always. Thank you so much. Thank you, Liz. Thank you. Frederick? Dear Dipesh, it is a wonderful pleasure and honor to celebrate your new book, The Climate of History in a Planetary Age. I want to begin by reminding our audience that the book is dedicated in part to all the humans and other living beings killed in the Australian firestorms and the Amphan cyclone in the Bay of Bengal. These are desperately sad and dangerous times. When the planet awakens, we all suffer. And yet, while the subject matter is grave and dark, this is also a warm and welcoming book written with a light touch filled with playful images, like the child Theo in the sandbox playing at terraforming. Something of the same philosophical equanimity shines through in the excerpt from Spinoza to Oldenburg that frames your introduction. Let me quote, for I do not think it right to laugh at nature and far less to grieve over it, reflecting that men like all else are only part of nature 
and that I do not know how each part of nature harmonizes with the whole and how it coheres with other parts. So I ask Depeche, could you tell us something about why you think philosophy can offer consolation in our planetary age? Another pleasing aspect of the book is its polyphonic and dialogic approach. Already in the introduction, we meet with a wide range of philosophers, geologists, historians, and social theorists, from Hannah Arendt to Jan Salasevich. At the heart of your argument is the principle of engagement that insists on openness and mutual respect. The historian's approach to the planet necessarily relies on other fields of inquiry, other experts. When a geologist or climate scientist makes claims of expertise, we ought to treat those with the same respect we accord to fellow historians. Science, history, and philosophy are equal partners rather than rivals locked in zero-sum battle. If we were to universalize this epistemic assumption of Depeche's, we might perhaps call it the method of earth system humanities. Your philosophical intervention also breaks ground in proposing novel fields of empirical inquiry. Here I'm thinking, for example, of the concept of fossil freedom introduced in the first chapter of the book. What would it mean to write a history of political thought and action that attends seriously to the coming of coal or oil? Surely fossil freedom is not just a question of mobility in the physical sense, trains, planes, and automobiles, but also a wider reframing of action and understanding. In my own work, I compare it to a suit that transforms the person who wears it, instilling new habits and patterns of thought, even to the point of possessing the wearer with a phantasmagoric sense of confidence. Such a cultural and political history of fossil freedom might also help answer another question you raise in the eighth chapter, when you ask how we should write the history of modern humans loss of fear, defined not as an instinct, but as a value. Now, I think there are two stages to that story. While early modern philosophers like Bacon and Descartes uh, inspired the initial stage of the rebellion, it seems plausible to argue that the collective rejection of fear came later when cheap energy transformed middle-class habits and practices. Perhaps we could also link it to the construction of a new human niche as public health measures made death and disease an exception rather than a rule in middle-class society. There's even a sense in which the science of geology itself may have helped dispel some of these fears. For Victorian middle-class people, the Holocene climate of the earth was a gift from God to bolster the nation and the empire. Perhaps we could say that the global project of capitalism and empire actually found in popular geology a willing prop for its cornucopian ambitions. This brings me to my final comment and question. Your book ends with a call for humans to restore their sense of reverence for the world, a relation with the earth that is marked not just by wonder, but also respect mixed in with fear and awe. Is there not a paradox here? You speak of the planetary as the external, indifferent face of the natural world, but should reverence not be directed just as much towards humanity itself as a planetary force? In midlife, the great subaltern poet John Clare, defender of the commons and peasant communities, wrote a series of astonishing poems about the birds of his parish. Snipes, sand martins, fern owls, thrushes, and nightingales all made a home in the woods around Clare's native village. They too formed communities in distinct landscapes. Their nests were miniature dwellings built to offer comfort and security, but their lives were shaded by constant fear of outside threats, above all human trespassers. Claire knew intimately the destruction wrought by hunters and collectors. He had grown up climbing trees and plundering nests for pleasure. Such a bird's eye view, looking down at people from the treetops, collapsed all distinctions of property and class, 
showing humans only as an undifferentiated and predatory mass. The same shift in perspective also revealed the intrinsic value of the natural world beyond economic use. In the woodlands, Claire found a sense of peace and refuge from the strains of village life and literary ambitions. Birds, he thought, were free from meddling toil, artificial toys, and mercenary spirit. This joyful encounter with the wild went hand in hand with an ethos of restraint. Claire no longer plundered nests, but was content to observe and record. You suggest at the very end of the book that we need to make the anthropocentric language of sustainability speak to the planet-centric idea of habitability. I guess I worry that the language of sustainability is too absorbed with questions of growth to serve us well. What we really need if we are serious about climate restoration, biodiversity and animal rights is perhaps an ethics of renunciation, retreat and repair. Does the path to reverence begin with a bird's eye view of what humans can do to the world? With very great affection. Thank you, Depesh. Thank you so much, Vidwit. So, uh, Emily, should I respond to them? Uh, Please respond, uh, and then okay. you three so carry maybe, on a conversation. Yeah, sure. Um, so, I, I'm just going to put your comments together, uh, Frederick and Liz, and, and respond to them. Uh, I can't do justice to the richness of the comments and to everything you've said. Some of some of what I miss out on, I hope, will come up in our conversation and also in uh, the Q and A period. Um, but thank you both. Uh, I mean, you've been comrades in, in this project and I've always gained from speaking to you both and from your research and everything. So um, I think what I could do uh, to explain one of the central points of the book and the argument it takes, the reason why it's talking to, speaking to historians about um, a new, about the planet as a perspectival uh, point, a planet as a perspectival kind of point from which to look back on our history uh, alongside the globe is another perspectival point and them being connected as this pointed out. But it also speaks um, kind of philosophically to historians and others about a change in the human condition. And I have something to say about that, but let me enter that question by speaking about the pandemic because Liz raised, and the pandemic is uppermost in my mind and the whole question of thinking long-term about something that's immediate and urgent. You know, it, it's, it's a crisis whose urgency and immediacy, it, who, whose, you can't deny. I mean, the, the first thing we think of is saving lives. The first thing we think of is actually administering to the distress of human beings. Uh, particularly in India, where people I know are dying, are in hospital. Uh, I know a family in which several generations are at the moment in, in, in fact, very dear. And, and, and you know, the, the greatest living Bengali poet died a few days ago. Uh, so, the, so let me speak of the pandemic. So when last year in September, uh, last September, Anthony Fauci and his colleague, David Morans published a paper in a biology journal, uh, arguing both the long-term aspects of the pandemic and its immediate aspects. So the immediate aspects of the COVID-19 pandemic are global because it's because we are global, we travel around, we are much more connected than before that that an infection that began somewhere in China within months became everybody's problem. And the, also, it had also to do with the fact that we're not just global, but we increasingly live in big cities. I mean, everybody says that humans will turn up as a city dwelling species uh, by the end of the century. Um, and these cities are crowded. We live sort of you know, close to one another. And therefore, it was our history of globalization that actually helped the uh, virus become global. The virus had lived uh, in different forms in, in the guts of bats 
they say, for millions of years. And bats are a much older species than we are. Bats have been around for 50 million years. Um, so, but the point, the, the chilling point that Fauci and his colleagues were making in that essay, and Fauci has said it in other, on other platforms too, he was saying that if you look at the frequency of the pandemics, or, or potential pandemics over the last 20 years, then you see that most 75% of the new infectious diseases that humans have suffered from are in nature what they call zoonotic diseases, that are diseases that come from wild animals. I mean, other we have other diseases that have their history in wild animals and our contact with them. But normally over thousands of years, you get you develop a certain kind of relationship to those diseases. But in the last 20 years, there have been like 13 possible uh, uh, pandemics. Uh, this one, the possibility became real, it got realized, right? So they're actually, they were warning that we are in an era of pandemics where we might um, get pandemics with much more frequently than we have ever before. And one reason that they and many other observers agreed on, and I think people who write about, virologists who write about problems of pandemics have also argued this, that the reason why we are getting um, diseases from wild animals is because we are cutting down forests, mainly for farming, but for mining, for you know, building human habitat and all kinds of reasons. Um, because wildlife doesn't you know, go out looking for us. They come close to us because we destroy their habitat. And so they were saying that, that look, these diseases have something to do with the global environmental crisis. And, and if you, See, sometimes we speak of the crisis only in terms of global warming, fixing on the temperature, fixing on the carbon dioxide side of it. But another part of the crisis is, is the crisis of biodiversity, the, the rate at which you know, species extinction is happening. And so, so part of the crisis has to do with our failure, not intellectually, I mean, intellectually, you know, but our failure to deal with the fact that as a form of life, we depend on other forms of life and often on forms of life that we, con we have considered inferior, quote unquote. Uh, and, and they were in, in one of the articles that Fauci was saying that, look, uh, this uh, coronavirus uh, has kind of, it has moved from the guts of one mammal to another mammal and is, is in a way pre-adapted to the human body, even before it comes, it comes to the human body. So from there, if you, but, but you see, if you look at the crisis in India today, and I'm, by today, I mean literally today, I was watching the news this morning. The biggest crisis in India is um, that they can't supply oxygen, medical oxygen, uh, in sufficient quantities. Now, part of that is mismanagement, part of that is governmental uh, uh, bad policy, part of that is complete failure of the political leadership in preparing the country, uh, so there are national failures, uh, but not regulating uh, election uh, meetings, not regulating religious festivals, which have become super spreader events. So part of that is failure of management, failure of uh, administration. But, but look at what people need. People need more medical oxygen. How is that oxygen produced? We produce medical oxygen by drawing oxygen from the atmosphere and then processing it through fractional distillation and other kinds of scientific processes. And who puts that oxygen up in the atmosphere? Other forms of life. So, so look at the look at the situation we're in. I mean, we are in a civilization, as you were saying, Frederick, where we are technology-based civilization, and one political goal of this civilization, I call it political because governments are held accountable for failures in public health. But one political goal of this civilization is to extend human life. So if in 17th century, you know, political, modern political thought, European political thought began by saying that the, that the one function of politics is to protect humans, life and property from predators, right? And as I discuss in the book that the predators were other humans because wild animals in the thinking of Hobbes, for instance, were already part of the state of nature. But over time, I would say political thought has extended. We have a, we don't talk about it, but when we talk about it, public health as the as the responsibility of the state or government, like whether we talk about wealth medical, socialized welfare, medicine, or private medical insurance, we 
are talking about what a modern civilization should produce. And the capacity of modern civilization, I'm going back to what Liz was talking about, is dependent on technology. Peter Heff's argument that without modern technology and everything that connects us, our numbers would crash to 11 million or something that he says. But, that, but he, whether or not that number is right, but he's saying our lives are critically dependent on modern technology. And it's with, with the help of modern technology that we make what used to be terminal diseases like cancer into chronic illnesses that we can then manage and, and, and extend lives. So in order to, so here is the state, here is the situation in India where the immediate task of treatment is to extend life. People are dying. For that, they need oxygen. But you can see how the ground of the problem is, of course, created by the fact that we are an oxygen-breathing animal. So we, in order to produce medical oxygen, we go back to the air. We draw oxygen from there, like you know, in parallel to the Haber Bosch, you know, the nitrogen fixing process, we draw oxygen from there in order to produce liquid oxygen, medical oxygen. Uh, and and uh, most of that use is in industrial and in military purposes. Uh, now they're trying to reconvert it. But, but that oxygen in the first place in the air is put up there by inferior forms of life. So the pandemic shows how much uh, our personal lives, our griefs, our bereavements today, our distress is both personal and planetary at the same time. You know, I was, I was watching all this and I was thinking I grew up in the 70s hearing that the person is political. And I don't know if the person is all political, and a lot of it is, I agree. But what I've come to realize is that the personal is also planetary. And, and, and the pandemic illustrates that for me. And I just, from there, I go back to the, the question you raised, Frederick, about philosophy or a philosophical kind of history and quickly say this. So I see, if you think of the pandemic, um, the pandemic is a good illustration of the problem that I'm thinking about in the, in the book. Though I'm thinking not through the pandemic, I'm thinking through global warming, climate change, and, and the loss of biodiversity. Those are the, uh, those are the things I think about. But the, the, but the pandemic shows our predicament that the pandemic is happening because the human um, the domain of human existence has increased dramatically, both over the 20th century and then from after the, from after the Second World War to now, the period we call the period of great acceleration. Our numbers have increased. We can sustain people for longer in spite of their being poor, poor people. You know, I'm not saying the quality of their lives are great, but people have lived longer. Thanks to technology, thanks. So in a way, we have already become a society that, that has gambled on technology for, for sustaining ourselves, right? As you said, I mean, sustenance is, uh, sustainability has to do with, and, and there's a question of justice about, about the poor, about uh, the inequalities in human beings. And a lot of that requires more technology. We need more energy to sustain the sort of freedoms that we've come to love. And if you want to distribute them more widely. So uh, somebody like Amartya Sen would argue that going forward, we need more energy, not less. So that's why the debate is about what, is, what should be the source of energy when we focus only on, 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 on temperature and if we lose sight of biodiversity and all of, all of those questions. So there is, so that's why this is a predicament because our human desires and human sense of freedom and human sense of well being that have come out of the last 150 years of developments from your Victorian cornucopianism, today's kind of cornucopianism, which is about immortality. I mean, human life can be extended. Some people, as you know, not some utopian, but scientistic people write about the possibility of immortality for, for human beings. I mean, unevenly distributed, but some humans can pay for, to, to be immortal, right? I mean, on the one hand, technology is promising that kind of uh, future. At the other hand, this extension of, of human uh, domain on the planet is pro creating problems for other forms of life. And when you think about it, humans are a minority form of life. The majority form of forms of life on the planet by weight and numbers are, are microbial. So in a way, if you think about the history of life then, and think of it as a building, then we are kind of on the top floor, <laughs> we come late, but we, we dominate the hell <laughs> out of the order of life on the planet. So sometimes I think of us as living like probably the 
white people lived in South Africa during the apartheid regime, right? A dominant minority that was making life very difficult for the, for the majority. So I agree with you. We have to, we have to think about minoritarian forms of thinking. Uh, which you express in the language of renunciation or whatever. Kind of. But at the same time, it, it's impossible to ignore the last 150 years of histories of freedom, of the desire for autonomy, the desire for equality that have also been fueled. I mean, as you, you described them as fossil freedoms, Jim Mitchell described them as carbon democracy, but carbon or fossil fuel, whatever, the feelings of democracy, the, the pleasure of being connected, the pride with which a poor Indian person holds up his Chinese made cheap smartphone. I mean, that's in front of you. And that's the story about the air conditioners in, in Delhi that Liz was referring to. So on the one hand, so we are in this, so that's why this the book is also about the change in the human condition, that this is a predicament. You know, in other words, it's tempting to think that we'll find the technological solution to a problem that in its multi-dimension seems intractable, right? So we're in a predicament. I'm not, my hope is, my hope lies in the fact that humans learn. We're a species capable of learning from our experience. So that's why I talk about the, the, um, the homo prudence, the kind of, you know, the, the, human, the human who will learn from experience. But, but here I go back to the kind of history that this book is talking about. So, you know, I was, I was brought up to be a, social scientist historian of a broadly Marxist anti-colonial variety, right? When I was did my when I did my PhD on jute mill workers, I initially I, I trained myself in some econometrics because I wanted to do production function graphs for the industry I was working on. Chicago was wonderful, the university. Chicago taught me the taught me to think clearly about the distinction between social science and humanities. Because I I taught uh, the Communist Manifesto, both in social science class and in humanities class at this university where humanities and social science constitute different divisions. I mean, they didn't in the University of Melbourne. It was all uh, the Faculty of Arts and Science or the Faculty of Arts or whatever. And I realized that when I taught the, the manifesto in a social science class, the questions we'll be discussing were questions like, okay, so what were Marx and Engels' argument about social change? Whereas in a humanities class, I'll ask, okay, what is this genre called the manifesto? How is it different from an essay? Who wrote the first manifesto? Right? I, I was we paid more attention to it. And, and I realized profoundly coming out to here that I am a humanities person. I'm a deeply a humanist person, not just a humanities person. And so this is a project in which I'm trying to see what the uptake of reading earth system science could be for a humanist. For humanities, person. but there's a secondary point, and I don't make it upfront in the book. The point is that as history became a social science discipline, it forgot the language of speaking about the human condition. It forgot to say that even in the most economic of histories that you may write, you are speaking of the human drama. You know, I, I often think of Ken Pomeranz's great book, The Great Di Divergence. As a story of you know four brothers, one of whom one of whom strikes lucky, right? It could be an ancient Greek drama about luck, right? And and so history could. I mean, we are often when you, even when we write sort of professional history, we forget that tragedy, irony, you know, all these figures of rhetoric are there through which we look at our lives. And so, in some ways, it's a call. Uh, see, I mean, it, 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 in some ways there is a, the book is saying that given this large scale history in which you read, if, where the planet itself becomes a perspective of vantage point for you, there's an argument for going back to enlightenment historians like, like Gibbon, you know, where you could be completely empirical and, and factual in the, in the facts you narrate, but at the same time, what you portray is a, is a human drama through the particular story you're telling. It's a story of human failures. And, and I'm not being totally utopian in saying that, you know, when I was in Australia, the person I read the least, but I was always curious about his work. And I, I read the least because it's, he wrote a multi-volume history of Australia called Man Called Manning Clark. And today I realized that what Clark was trying to do was to write a Gibbonesque history of a settler colonial country, right? And, um, 
so maybe i'll uh, so i think there is a there's a question of what kind of histories will we write until we get to a point where uh, our students and faculty are actually able to do research like uh, geologists do or archaeologists do which we don't we are still archival historians so we are not going to do the kind of research they're doing but we are taking perspective from what from what we are learning from their writing so this question of writing histories that actually address the human condition came up for me while working on this book because in a way the history as uh, this was saying this whole question of cross hatching histories of different scales moving between different scales while keeping the human condition and the predicament at the center of the story because the predicament comes out of these different scalar and different scaled entities coming together um so i have things to say about your other comments but maybe i'll end there and within the interest of discussion and time thank you very much both of you um let's do one more Edward, do you want to each say a few words yeah um, i'll yield to liz go ahead oh gosh me okay yes i mean thank you depesh that was uh hugely interesting on on covid and and very rich otherwise um uh, one of my favorite uh imaginative ways that you show how we might write these cross cross-hatched histories in the book is when you're talking about uh, something familiar in lots of families the south asian diagnosed with diabetes and how we could see this you know one hand as a kind of autobiographical moment but we can also trace it back to you know a couple of centuries maybe of sedentary upper caste existence or we could look still further back to um i suppose the the holocene stability that enabled rice agriculture and eating lots of rice and then switching diets or even further as well to uh human hunter gatherer practices and and their long afterlives so i like these hints of of how we might imagine uh, uh, writing these things um i i'd love to push you on on a question i i find this uh where you're going with technology towards the end of the book endlessly interesting and i'm very interested as well with um along with with carl schmidt along with heidegger one of the recurrent figures is hannah arendt and i'm very interested in this provocative uh, way you're using labor and work here and i i wondered if uh, i could invite you to talk a little bit about that so your argument again to to do huge violence to it being that capital ends up having fewer requirements for let bodily labor and turning instead to work by other sorts of energy i i thought this was hugely striking and it kind of nicely ties back to frederick's questions about fossil fuels as a kind of uh, lens both on fossil powered freedoms and as one of these interscalar vehicles that goes all the way to the deep earth to deep time and connects it back to the present so that that would be my question to you no again a, a great question and i'll have to do violence both to your question and, and to what i've said in the book to be quick about this um so so i think i i often think of exemplar human humans who show us uh, give us examples of exercising freedom without becoming too dependent on energy supplied from outside their bodies you know with some some geologists who talk about uh, anthropocene uh, as an informal term and who argue that it should be an informal term and who say the ancient anthropocene which begins with the hominin Uh, uh development of capacity to manage fire because then you have a species that has more energy available to it than its must mus- simple muscle power could give to it, right now uh, but i think of a very well known human being who who might think of as deeply invested in questions of freedom but also deeply invested in divesting from energy that came from outside of his body and that's gandhi so in i mean you know frederick's exemplar is ruskin 
uh, because he, he works on British history and British history of British Empire. And because I come from South Asia, my exemplar is Gandhi. I mean, here is a human. Now, again, one has to remember that Sarojini Naidu's quip while saying that, because Sarojini Naidu, this great uh, poet and a nationalist woman, said to Gandhi that, you know this, Liz, that when she said that uh, uh, Bapuji, that's what they used to call him, right? If only you knew how much it costs the nation to keep you in poverty. So, 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 so Gandhi and, see, I mean, uh, it goes back to another question you raised. I was thinking Gandhi, Nehru, for them, even though they had different models of development in mind, development had a spiritual side. Uh, spiritual side in the sense that it spoke to questions of justice, interhuman justice. It spoke to questions of moral courage. It spoke to questions of, as Gandhi would say, reading people of the fear of colonial officials, right? Abhay, fearlessness, by which he meant moral courage. And I have no argument against moral courage. I think moral courage is always needed, even to speak the truth. Um, but so there's, there was, there's all that in, and, and we need to keep that in, in mind. But, but when you, but the, the distinction between labor and work struck me reading, uh, reading about, and also talking to people like our mutual friend, Prono Bartman, about um, this idea of um, universal basic income that many economists have been talking about. And, uh, and in one of the contexts in which, it's not the only context, but one of the contexts in which it was, uh, this question of universal basic income was arising was the phenomenon of what in India friends call jobless growth, where GDP increases, but uh, uh, employment doesn't to the same degree. Or you know, when the Adanis were, uh, they still are probably, going to build a coal mine in Queensland in Australia, I mean, the initial promise was, or, or the government was justifying it by saying that they're going to employ 10,000 people. But near the time when the mine was being, it was clear that they wouldn't employ more than 1,500 people because a lot of the mining is actually done by machinery, not, not by people as, as, it, as you, know, you find in stories about coal mining uh, before. And, and clearly um, the application of AI to various facets of, of work uh, means that, that a lot of work that was done before by the human body and before that by the animal body, and which is one reason why we still have the expression horsepower, right? As a, as a, as a measure of uh, energy of, of motors. There's a memory of animal using animal power. Um, as I thought about that, it sort of I, I realized, and and in the book, it's it's really as a hypothesis, a speculative thought. I mean, I don't go into it. One day I'd love to work on it. Is that is that the word labor in most European languages? It often goes back to forms of toilsome labor. It goes back to sort of um, labor that is unpleasant. And in, in the German, in German, the word actually means the labor of the original etymological root, root word means the, the labor of orphan children. Whereas work goes back to the Greek word for energy. So the, the idea of work is pretty much what 17th century physicists would say, is the amount of energy you spent in doing something. Whereas the idea of labor, it is actually about toil and goes back to the, either the toil that an animal is experiencing or a human is, is performing. And, and my argument was that Marxist theory, you know, in Marxist theory, the body of the labor is so important. Whether you think about abstract labor, whether you think about extraction of surplus value, it's really the body of the labor is central to his understanding of capital labor relationship. Whereas it seemed to me that somewhere in the history of capitalism, they found out that a lot of the so-called labor could be done by the work of machines. You could, in other words, it literally became energy spent. So the application of AI, the computer design production, the CA, you know, the CAD CAM, uh, things that we used to read about in, in business schools, you know, computer-aided uh, production and management. So, so it seemed to me that there's been a shift. There's been a kind of a history of redundancy 
of of human labor in that in that form and 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 the fascinating uh, development which uh, again i'm a specialist of but uh, talking to some uh, trade unionists in australia i found out that the, the more you go to non renewable uh, renewable fuels like solar panels and stuff it's a team it's a team mitchell problem labor becomes very casual it's not it's not a continuing sort of you know a uh, sort of you know 8 to 8 or whatever 10 to 5 labor so it's it's the so the trade union is facing it's much harder to organize laborers who go around installing solar panels because between installing solar panels they're doing other kinds of work so this fragmentation of work that the, that phenomenon like uber and other forms of labor that we see uh, this flexibility of labor i think it, it also points to this uh, the fact that a lot of the work with uber is being done by apps and 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 the talk about you know smart motor cars driverless motor cars and all of this pointing in this direction and many economists today as you know including i think uh, my friend and colleague raghuram rajan in our business school are speaking either of saving the social or of social regulation of technology yeah, but but that's a very i mean i'm not a specialist in that area and i think it's a very contested area you know uh, because technology is um i mean the, the person who is designing new google or whatever they are looking at the bottom line and designing the new program or whatever that will you know bring bring in more money and which will connect us more quickly whatever uh but but clearly the revolution in technology is probably producing a redundancy in the old forms of labor and toil that um, capital is a classic theory of das capital I wonder if it would be a good point to take some questions from the audience. Sure. All right, I'm going to group together a couple that deal with planetary thinking in some shape or form. So, Aditya writes, what if we think the planetary through thinkers like Ambedkar Ambedkar, who was also an advocate of modernization, and yet coming at it from radically different ways from others such as Nehru. I guess in some sense the question is about under what conditions is planetary thinking possible? Fatma, who writes to us from Turkey, wonders whether COVID-19 will urge everybody to become planetary sooner rather than later, voluntarily or involuntarily. Joshi writes, the bird's eye view of Earth was profoundly reached with the overview effect viewed by astronauts on the Apollo missions and the image they sent back. There was a hope that this perspective would change people's ethics, but this was falsely universalizing. Is there some other avenue for achieving Johnson's, Frederick's, ethics of renunciation or retreat and the paradoxical ethics of reverence of the human? how might we approach this ethical place are there models of this behavior that we can look to and finally from steven do you have any thoughts on amitav ghosh's questions on how the planetary perspective can be imagined in contemporary fiction the scope and scale of planetary processes seem to burst the seams of the short story or novel yet fiction might be the most effective vehicle to shift public thought and feeling from the global to the planetary so you have various perspectives on what i'm loosely calling planetary thought and promoting it and why don't you take a stab and frederick and liz you too frederick do you want to do you want to speak to the bird question while i get them my thoughts together on another question um well i was i was playing with the term birds eye view right and i actually did um i did have apollo 8 in mind uh, as exactly an imperial gesture just in the in the way yeah. you suggest joshi um it, it, there's a recording that i'd like to play to my students of the astronauts on apollo 8 uh you know after taking the picture of earth rise they read out the first verses of genesis um <laughs> they were carrying a a very old idea of dominion into space um right so how would we go about inventing an alternative ethics of renunciation from a true birds eye view from the point of view of the nightingale's nest not the moon 
right? Um, I'm not so sure, um, but I'd speak, thinking with Depeche and Liz about COVID-19, it seems to me uh, it, it's an interesting fork in the road. Um, and in some sense, the vaccination campaign has been an astonishing success, a very heartening um, you know, source of optimism about technology. But on the other hand, I can't help but think about the true solution to the uh, accelerating rate of, of um, epidemics, of pandemics, must be some kind of active renunciation, right? Um, to stop the projects that encroach on the bat habitats, right? Um, but precisely how that could be done while still protecting local livelihoods and giving work, meaningful work, to people in those areas. Um, I mean, that's beyond my can. Back to you, Depeche. Okay, th thank you. No, that that's very helpful. So quickly, I mean, the, the questions that had Aditya's question about Ambedkar and planetarity is an interesting question. Um, see the the way in which uh, two things to say. One is that actually I have a a chapter in the book where sort of reading uh, my reading of uh, what I call the, the Dalit body through basically uh, Rohit Demula's suicide note. I mean, I produce him. It's called planetary aspirations, and I put. I, so I would invite you to uh, take a look that look at the chapter and see if it answers some of your query. But I just want to say that I use the planetary in a very particular sense, which is what I get from Earth system science and Earth system science. Uh, is a science that develops long after Ambedkar. The NASA sets up its first uh, system science committee in 1983. I mean, it was happening from, I mean, it has a longer history. There's no question, you know, uh, but I, I don't, I mean, I see Ambedkar's critique of the Nehruvian modernization or even of uh, Gandhian uh, views of modernity. Um, but I would have to think more about connecting Ambedkar to the way in which I'm trying to use the word planetarity here. And, and I would invite you to take a look at the book if possible, and, and maybe we can re-engage the question. To my friend Fatma in Turkey, th thank you, Fatma, and thank you for, for being there. Um, well, I mean, the, 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 we'll be, see the, okay, let's stay with the planetary, with the planetary question, planetary governance, with the uh, example of the pandemic. So people who think of a global management, a kind of a world governance of plan pandemics, basically argue for a model where uh, you would have to give, you know, much stronger teeth to WHO uh, so that they're able to go in into any spot on the planet where a pandemic or an epidemic is on the verge of a breakout. And they will go in quickly in a commando-like fashion, round up the people who are infected, and, and sequester them somewhere so that the infection doesn't spread. But it requires national governments to make compromises on their sovereignty question. And you, and you could see how, how cagey the Chinese were initially about sharing information. So, uh, I mean, I think there are many problems in the, on the, in the world that now call for at least some kind of regional management, the health of the Himalayan glaciers, the health of the Amazon forest, you know, these are critical uh, things that determine the planet's climate and they should be on some kind of world climate heritage list or whatever. But, but, uh, but the glaciers in between China and India and other countries are all treated as national properties. The rivers are treated as national properties. You know, there are the rivers, eight or nine rivers coming out of the Himalayas service uh, countries from Pakistan to Vietnam, but there's no agreement. So in, in many ways, the UN is the structure we have, which is why we have an IPCC, nations where nations come and bargain. It may very well be an inadequate structure for the kind of problems we are facing. And we, we may have to go through a history of having a replacement organization for the UN eventually. But at the moment, what we have is, have is UN. I agree with uh, what Frederick was said about the blue marble uh, picture. See, the blue marble is not my, uh, my idea of the planet. The blue marble is exactly the idea of the globe because it's really what the globe looks like if you could place yourself outside uh, and look at it from the outside in. And there had been actually imaginations of the globe long before it was actually seen from. So for me, 
um, the blue marble picture is the culmination of the global because what is what i call the planet is a is a is a timothy morton uh, type hyper object it's something that's created it's an abstraction it's created it's put together by computer modeling by satellite observations uh, by ice core samples so it's actually a, a, it's actually an entity that's why i said it's an abstraction like marx's capital or hegel state which is given a certain dynamism by the constructor of the of the of the category the scientist and then the scientists themselves having constructed it have very human like citizen like reactions to this mental object that they've created so the earth system is not something you see or you bump into uh, the earth system is a hyper object the planetary climate system you don't see you experience weather you experience local climate uh, you don't see it so in that sense it's really the blue marble is part of the global and to the question about him the, the novels and short stories you know being burst I, I agree and i think kim stanley robinson is a very interesting uh, writer to think about in this in this context yeah. shall we do some more questions sure there are many questions and i know we're not going to be able to get them all um but I'm going to pair here just two questions together. One is from our friend Dan Smale. Hello, Dan. And like the moderate, the commentators today, he, it's, he uses the epistolary form. He writes, Dear Depeche, I wonder if you could walk us through the terrible contradiction between what we as human beings think about the pandemic and what the polar bear thinks about the pandemic. We mourn the loss of life and speak hopefully of the coming victory over COVID-19. If the polar bear and many non-human beings could speak, would they celebrate the virus, mourn its defeat, and hopefully await the coming of the next savior? Jorge, in a similar vein, wonders, and I'm abbreviating here, how can we attend to myriad social crises that capture our immediate imaginaries and everyday politics while balancing being mindful of Earth systems, planetary finitude? Would you mind repeating the second one, Emily, please? How can we attend to many social crises that capture our immediate imaginaries and everyday politics while balancing being mindful of Earth systems, okay. the planet? Thank you. Thank planetary you. Planetary finitude is what he says. Yeah, okay, thank you. So first of all, but to, maybe we need to attend to the polar bear. Right, that's what I'm, yeah, so to Dan's question. First of all, my very grateful thanks to Dan. I mean, he has been with us, not just me, but actually with us. Uh, from the beginning of this project, his work on deep history was a great inspiration for our thinking. Uh, and, you know, his generosity, his intellectual comradeship, all of those things are valued tremendously. And we all have. I mean, uh, so come back to Chicago and spend some more time here. Then I totally agree with you. The polar bear view of human of humanity, I suspect, would be complementary. Um, so, so it's you know, I mean, there's no end to literature that humans have produced complementing themselves. I mean, there's for thousands of years. I mean, it's I mean, there's a um, there's an ancient Sanskrit hymn we were used to. We were taught in school uh, where uh, the hymn addresses this whoever they are as Amrita Saputra, the sons of the immortal. Now, when you read the hymn, read through it, it's not clear to me that the sons of the immortal are humans. They might very well be gods that actually, uh, an assembly of gods are probably being addressed. But we were always told that humans are the sons of the immortal. So I think I was brought up on what probably was a misinterpretation of that Sanskrit hymn. We used to sing it in school as a kind of compliment to ourselves. So the the uh, I mean, there, I mean, human beings are, of course. I mean, look, uh, complex life is a miraculous formation, and uh, I don't. And there are mirac there are things that are miraculous about individual humans. Uh, no question. But the but the polar bear view. Um, or species that are becoming extinct, species that are suffering, uh, might not be complementary. But on the other hand, the coronavirus might be very grateful for the kind of opportunities we actually uh, presented to the virus for becoming global. Think, think of it now. Now the, the virus is a global address. It lives everywhere, and, it, and we'll have to learn to live with it. 
Um, so uh, yeah, so even in non-human forms of life, if they could speak and talk, then I think it's, look, even the squirrels in our cities would be grateful that we are there because if we were not there, then the squirrels would be all gobbled up by I think you know coyotes or wolves or whatever. So so there's this history of uh, contrary relation to other, other forms of life, but but yeah, polar bears wouldn't be very happy about us, I think. Um, and uh, the balancing of uh, our social needs, see, this is why I call it a predicament. You know, the, the main problem here is not that you can't find some kind of principle uh, in theory, or that sounds rational. So a rational choice person would say, you know, oh yeah, there's a solution, you know, cut down on coal or whatever. Um, or Frederick's principle of renunciation that he talked about, or I, it which reminds me of, Edward Wilson's book, Half, Half the Planet, uh, where he's, he has a concrete proposal that there are, about, I forget how many, but maybe 143, 144 national parks in the world. And he, should, he says we should go back to these parks and, and, um, and allow these parks to go back to their original ecological situation. So take out the invasive species. When some of these parks, humans have actually taken out capstone species, the capstone species, so that other species have declined. So there are, there are many, proposals on, 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 on the desk for humans to consider. And he, but here I go back to something that I noticed in human history and something again, Carl Schmidt uh, teaches me to think about uh, alongside Hannah Arendt, that humanity does not constitute a universe, it constitutes a pluriverse. Humans, it, humans except for, at least in our for historical examples, except for certain critical moments of crisis, will find it very hard to all agree on one rational proposition and come under the umbrella of that proposition. And unfortunately, there's no guarantee that even if they came under the umbrella of one rational proposition and built institutions according to that, that some humans would not game those institutions. You know, that 1984 wouldn't happen um, to, to their advantage. So that's why for me, it's a very interesting predicament, but Having said that, I also have to say over time, we do learn on certain things. Uh, it would be very hard, impossible for somebody today in India, whatever the actual situation on the ground, to come out and defend untouchability. It will be very hard in, in the US for someone to come out and defend slavery. I mean, these, these movements, but they've taken sometimes hundreds of years to actually for us to get to those positions. So as I see it, I think, we will learn, but we will not learn without some suffering and without crisis. Do you want another question? Sure. There are so many, and I will say to the audience members that we will, the Depeche and Frederick and Liz are all going to pour over these questions afterwards. So, But can we see them sitting. afterwards? What, oh, once yes, done, we will can... save them and distribute them. And okay. They're wonderful. Okay. It's just we don't have time to get to them all. Um, we okay. have a question here from Pierre Charbonnier from Paris. Oh, yeah. I have a question about the idea of fear that appears toward the end of the book through a discussion on Hobbes, discussion of Hobbes. You remind us that the elimination of fear of nature and of each other by the sovereign is the basic element of modern political thought. And it looks like you want us to learn how to be afraid again or to change how we conceive of safety. I'd like you to develop on this point in a context in a context where climate politics revolve more and more around the issue of quote global security. What would be the post Hobbesian anthropocentric sovereign? How would he or she manage fear and the need for safety? Pierre, wonderful questions. Thank you for being being here. Um, um, very interesting questions, Pierre. Thank you. And I'll, uh, I, I won't be able to do justice to um, the entirety of it. I, I hope when we meet or when we write, we'll um, talk more about this. But let me say, say something about fear. Um, so my, my esteemed colleague, Martha Nussbaum, has a book, uh, actually her Tanner lectures called Frontiers of Justice. And if you see in that book, the argument she gives as to why humans should care for even animals they are, uh, that would normally eat us like tigers or other animals. 
Uh, it's an argument actually based on Aristotle's idea of wonderment. Uh, so the argument is that there are other forms of life and we wonder about, we wonder about them. Uh, and therefore wonderment is the basis from which he develops an interesting argument as to why we should care. But it seems to me that wonderment and curiosity, particularly curiosity that comes out of wonderment, have, uh, has sometimes been a kind of um, a friend, a close friend of the enterprise of imperialism and colonialism. I mean, which is why so many settler colonial histories are full of histories of curiosity and exploration. But the histories of explore, explorers is also a history of colonization, uh, uh, sometimes based on native knowledge, indigenous knowledge, but and sometimes not. So, uh, whereas the question of reverence, which is uh, to be respectful of something and the feeling of respect mixed in with feelings of awe, which uh, theologically Rudolf Otto wrote about in the German context in his book, The Holy, uh, was something that interested me because I saw a version of it uh, in even in the urban Calcutta I grew up in, which was kind of in semi-rural, slightly rural parts of Calcutta, uh, not completely urbanized, uh, or, in the, or in the countryside in more peasant surroundings. Um, when you, when you, even from my sense of uh, rural life that I've seen little bits of growing up in India and growing up in kind of rural Calcutta, which then urbanized uh, on the outskirts, you grew up with knowing that inducing fear in the other, bluffing, was part of interspecies relationships. You know, a, a, a snake bluffs, a dog bluffs, even a frog. I mean, uh, at night you would uh, hear this weird croaking of a frog that you would in the morning discover was a little, small little thing, but at a huge, would produce a huge volume of sound to scare things off. And, and I think humans kind of took, human history uh, technology allowed us to take us, as it were, out of this realm in which we were no longer bluffing, nobody could bluff us. But the, but the problem, either theories of wonderment didn't reckon with, the problem and what human beings didn't know for a long time, that there are forms of life which we can't see. See, old theorists like Aristotle could see up to insects. The Buddhists and Jains in preaching sort of their philosophy of nonviolence could instinct, insects, the insects are what we can see, but actually these microbial forms of life, bacteria, Viruses are forms of existence that we don't, we can't see. And now we know, thanks to science, that they are the majority form of life. So even the kind of ethical positions and other kind of positions that's actually developed in animal um, liberation literature, I mean, it's still based on forms of life that you can see. Uh, so um, when I was talking about this, this reverence, so I was talking about a social form in which this reverence was in, instinctual. I, if people had it. And I think there's a history of how we lose it. And, and I, in my book, I say that's partly a provincializing Europe exercise because Europe first does it first. That's why when I read Hobbes and I see that he puts wild animals straight in the state of nature. So for Hobbes, politics begins with the banishment of wild animals. I mean, if wild animals are part of your living environment, <clears throat> then you don't know where sovereignty is. And one of the most fascinating, <clears throat> I can't theorize it, but one of the fascinating things happening in India today, because of the loss of habitat, is that wild animals are trying to become urban animals. And that's happening in many other parts of the world. So <clears throat> leopards are trying to come into cities and sometimes they've discovered that street dogs are an awful nuisance because they gang up and howl when a, when a leopard comes and announces the leopard's arrival. So they've worked out that domestic pets, domestic dogs are much easier to hunt and much better to eat because they, 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 they eat better. Uh, and there are fascinating cases of this happening in Mumbai. So, and how do you define sovereignty? And I've been to uh, seminars by uh, specialists in the West, actually uh, by a French scholar on designing eco-friendly cities. And you know, in the imagination that he had of the city, and I don't blame him, there was no room for street dogs. 
And I can't imagine an Indian city without street dogs. I can't imagine Delhi without the monkey menace, so-called. You know, there are parts of Delhi where monkeys live so well that you can't dare to go there for a morning walk. Your friends will tell you, oh, don't go there. There are too many monkeys. So it, you raise a fascinating question. What is happening to sovereignty? And, you know, if the climate change argument, the IPCC argument sometimes is that since we're going to be an urban dwelling species, there should be more governmental powers given to cities, which is not happening in India. But if you did give more governmental powers to cities, how would cities define their sovereignty vis-a-vis -vis the wild animals that are also trying to become urban? Uh, I, this question is absolutely open for me, Pierre. It's a wonderful question. I hope you, I, and many other friends will work on this question to define a post-Hobbesian sense of sovereignty. Absolutely. Thank you. I do feel that we are at 11.29, according to my clock, and we end at 11.30. And the regret I am with which I am filled is there are still so many terrific questions. So I think, I, I, Frederick and Liz, do you have any last words that you want to say? And then Depeche, if you want to say anything. Um, but I fear we are at our end. Liz, do you, do you have a final word? No, just go and buy the book. This has really been the tip of the aptly proverbial iceberg. And, you know, if you want a truly mind altering experience, definitely go and, and peruse each of these essays carefully. But thank you, Depeche. This has been enormous fun. Although Andrew Jamerton did wonder about, should we apologize to the forest for the dead trees felled by our books, which maybe means we should buy digital copies of the book. But then that also has a, its own digital ecosystem and costs as well, doesn't it? So it does. It, Andrew, it, thank you for that point. Um, Frederick. Now, just to say what a thrill and delight it's been to talk to Liz and Depeche and you, Emily, about, about this wonderful, wonderful book. And to say, and to echo Depeche's uh, question about post-Hobbesian post security, we actually have a fox who uh, has decided uh, it, it lives with us uh, right near our house. We see it every morning now. And Depeche, final Well, word. it's really my turn to thank you all, everybody, people who turned up from different places, friends and people I don't know. As I said, I'm really grateful to people from India because, I mean, this morning had me in tears and reading some of the Indian news. And thank you to everybody. It's been a great honor to be part of this. Thank you. Thank you. And I thank Frederick and Liz, and I thank Depeche for this inspiring and generous book. Um, and I thank the audience. It's really been wonderful to be able to do this. And I hope you will join us at future such events. Thank you. <laughs>